Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the third regular episode of The Dark Parade. Thank you, as always, for joining me. And uh, we've got a good one today uh, for a change, as uh, a wise man once joked. Um, this is uh, my conversation with Dan Chase of the Cut to the Chase podcast, all about the film Psycho 3. We are making our way through the Psycho film series. We've got one more to go after this, but uh, we'll look ahead to that later. Once again, I just want to say a big thanks to Dan who joined me for this. Uh, be sure you check out his other stuff. And uh, without further ado, settle back, relax, and enjoy. And thanks for joining The Dark Parade. All right, so with me uh, on this conversation of Psycho 3, uh, arguably the best of all Psycho movies. No, not again. That's not, it's not really going to happen. Is uh, the the one and only Dan Chase. Dan, first of all, thanks for, for doing this. Dude, thank you for having me, Bo. I appreciate it. Uh, second of all, we'll do this again at the end, but um, you are uh, like a, a, a hardworking podcaster, one of those people that, does shows all the time now cut to the chase is the big one yes um, yes cut to the, yeah it's our main show yep yep and then uh you, you do some side stuff as well so l remind me of those because i'll forget yeah man so my biggest thing with podcasting has always been um it's kind of backwards in that you find something and then it seems like you have to create its own podcast around what you want to cover I just want to cover everything that I love, you know, and uh, one of the things that we do is cut to the cartoon commentary. That's we literally just watch like Saturday morning cartoons. It's not just exclusively Saturday morning cartoons. We cover everything and it's just a lot of fun. We talk about old nostalgic cartoons, like literally anything and everything. We're doing old Jetsons, Scooby-Doo. Um, uh, Spider-Man, X-Men, uh, it's just a lot of fun and it's provided an avenue to just kind of have a laid back atmosphere and, and watch some cartoons and talk over them. So that's that show. Uh, Lacey Lou has uh, Skip to the Lou and that's basically exclusively for interviews and anything else that she wants to do when I'm not available because I'm working. <laughs> so that's what that is um and she's she's been having uh tremendous success over there and she's been getting some great interviews she's crushing it uh on that as well um under our same feed is her big show over there with all the ladies from the slumber party massacre as well so all those shows are under the cut to the chase umbrella and yeah man that's what we do excellent yeah i think you know, I kind of ripped you guys off in a way because I was like, I want to be able to do a bunch of stuff, but I want it all under one umbrella so you're not constantly pitching, you know, 10 different podcasts. So that's kind of what Dark Parade was. It was just like, hey, how can I do everything that I want to do, but have it in one central location like a flea market? And yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I, I like to think of myself really as the flea market of podcasting, both in uh quality and uh of uh, uh space retail space um yes <laughs> so we're talking obviously talking about psycho 3 which is i would say the first sequel that goes full slasher right and you know as opposed like obviously the first film is considered in some ways the first, like a proto slasher and that kind of thing but it's really a mystery thriller and i would argue the second one is as well yes um, you know yes. that's that's much more of a like who could possibly be doing this to norman or is he just crazy kind of thing and in right. this one it's just like uh, no bullshit norman's uh crazy and now, do you like that aspect of it um, I do. I or at least going back through it, it's been the thing that I've really enjoyed. It is sort of, you know, like I hesitate to call it a thriller because I, I think thriller can be such a vague term. Right. Um. Right. I I like that it has these elements of mystery that I think elevates it to a degree over. You know, it makes it more like a a, a weird giallo as opposed to just a straight you know like hell night level slasher which that's a good comparison i like that 
And and so I this one though it, it dispenses with all that and it's just like it, from from jump we know Norman Bates is a crazy person that is going <laughs> to kill people. Yeah. Yes. And I think in the second one man playing with is this really happy? Is somebody doing this to him? You didn't know if Norman was crazy or not. I think that really works for that movie. And I love kind of the twist to that, or I guess the ending to that. And, and, and that's, what's good about that. But then where do you go from that? You can't really do the same thing over again. So I think that this was kind of, um, this felt like a natural progression for the series. Yeah. And, and we talked about in, the second episode or the psycho two episode how it was certainly influenced by the wave of slasher movies and there are elements in psycho two of that and psycho three is just like okay we're just gonna be that right right put jeff fahey in there like we're going balls to the walls (laughs) yeah and and they they had to lure anthony perkins back into the role and the way they did it is for him to step into the director's chair for this movie which uh which is a lot of fun like there what (laughs) i like most about this movie i think is that it feels like a a giallo much more so than a lot of the other psycho films because all the lighting is so extreme all the blues and especially the reds are just blown out in this movie yep and, yep. and it looks good. Like, it's a good-looking movie. Um, so, and it, all right, so this starts a month after the events of Psycho 2. Mm-hmm. And pretty much up top, we know that uh, Norman Bates is reopening the motel. He has Mrs. Spool, the lady that he <laughs> brained with a shovel in Psycho 2, <laughs> uh, all uh, taxidermied up, and has, and she is now the mother figure. Yes, yes, and which I thought was brilliant too. It's almost like he was so nostalgic and so specific in the first movie, and then after the second one, he was just happy to be home again. Like he was just happy to have his setup again. And then when he smacked that bitch in the head with the shovel, he was like, "All right, you're my mother now." Like I yeah. just love it. It's almost like making no excuses for the fact that, yes, he is a psycho. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And so this one starts with um, a character named Maureen Coyle, uh, a nun who is having, to put it lightly, a crisis of faith. I mean, the movie starts off with her screaming, there is no God. Right. And uh, and so she's a real mess. Uh, it, It turns out... Uh, she is uh, a nun who perhaps took her vows too early or something and and basically is banished from this convent uh, after she runs. She, in theory, she's going to run up this bell tower and throw herself off, but that actually results in the accidental death of one of the other nuns. That opener bow is fire. Like, yeah, when yeah, I yeah. first walked, right? Like, I did not expect that at all. I was like, oh, shit, okay, like, strap in, folks. <laughs> and it's a clear reference, uh, b- visually, to Hitchcock's Vertigo. Vertigo! I mean, yeah, it is, you know, the, the long shots up the stairwell and looking at the, and like, even seeing somebody fall out the window and whatnot, and... <laughs> You know, it, yes. it's right. It's Perkins being like, eh, eh, anybody see Vertigo? Huh? Right. And, <laughs> yeah. And so then uh, Maureen Coyle, the nun, is they're like, get the fuck out of here. They're like, we can't have you murdering nuns, accidental or not. Uh, right. <laughs> in our, in exactly. our convent. So they tell her yeah. to hit the road, which she does. <laughs> Yeah. She just grabs a suitcase, throws her stuff in the suitcase, and just starts wandering through the desert, Jesus-like, um, <laughs> until she runs uh, afoul of Duke, who is this uh, musician, I'm putting in quotes. You know, yeah. he's got a guitar, and yeah. but, you know, he's not really making a living, and... Uh, he stops and pick, picks her up. He's got, you know, his shitty car. And, and uh, they're they're driving, and he's 
like super gregarious. He's like cocaine friendly. You know, where he's just like, so, uh, so what you doing out here, huh? What, what, having car trouble, are you? What, what kind of car trouble? I don't have a car. Uh, that's the worst kind of car trouble in the world. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, you know, just, <laughs> right. It is yeah. just pure Coke energy from this guy. Right, right, right. And, and you know, it's funny because his acting, I, I love Jeff Fahey, by the way. I think he's great. And, you know, his acting in this, it, it it's odd because my journey with horror movies, it was, uh, like I said to you before, you know, I'm kind of basic in a sense. So when I found these movies and when this movie took place, and what was this made in 86, I believe? I will, uh, 85 or 86? Yeah, 86 is when it was released. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was so refreshing, though, to to see a movie that that it wasn't exactly like a straight up slasher in in the sense that i think of you know with your jasons and your michaels and your and and your freddies even and stuff like that so to see first of all um anthony perkins directed this which when i first saw it i had no idea and to to see that this kind of fits in that time period and doesn't necessarily fit one thing like you explained it. it's like a giallo and it's all these things i still I, like i just kind of started watching giallos last year <laughs> you know and so it, it's still all very new to me but it's so interesting going back and seeing movies um you know kind of adapt and take certain aspects from other movies throw in these things as well and this is what you got so it was almost like when i rewatched this it was a completely different watch for me um and i will tip my hat to it was even better than last time like i thoroughly enjoyed this watch but Je- jeff fahey will never not be ridiculous <laughs> yeah and he, he's real over the top here and and i think maybe i uh i'm definitely not the first person to say this but anthony perkins after psycho took off to europe because uh Ooh. the the notoriety and and the sorts of roles he was being offered were just born out of psycho like it was such a massive hit and everybody looked at him as norman bates so he went to europe yep. for a while and i think this feels much more like european cinema than american right. cinema in a lot of ways because of of you know the the bold lighting and and some of that kind of thing and right. um also the fact that yeah, they, this was written by a guy named Charles Edward Pogue, um, who had written uh, such films as uh, DOA. He he wrote the Fly remake is probably most oh. famously. Um, really? Yeah. And, oh wow! And this was, if I'm not, I'm I'm probably mixing this up, but I think this was originally written as a parody where they were doing. Uh, they, they had opened the uh, Bates Motel as a murder, like uh, like uh, uh, one of those murder getaways where you can go like go okay. and stay at the Bates house. And right. um, he ended up going back uh, like Norman Bates gets out of the, the giggle factory and then poses as an <laughs> actor and is hired to be Norman Bates. Oh, I love it. I and love and that. starts killing people, but the, the studios were like, look, we, that's a little too ridiculous. Oh, uh, that's awesome, though. I love that. That's yeah. crazy. Okay. Yeah, right. which, yeah, that would have been really, really fun. And, and you know, just one of those things where the studio was right. like, absolutely not. Like, but people, I get that, too, though. <laughs> sure. Well, the studio was like, look, we, people are here to see Norman Bates hack up people. We're not here to see this kind of right. meta commentary on psycho right. um <laughs> but, but anyway so yeah so jeff fahey picks up the this nurse um you know she is uh like just very withdrawn and she like again she's going through this incredible crisis not just of faith but like she's yeah. suicidal right and right and he is uh like at, at a certain point rain starts pouring down as it does in a psycho movie <laughs> and, and they have to pull over and they're going to stay there for the night and jeff a he attempts to rape her right 
but she gets away and and kind of runs off. Yeah. And then we uh she she makes her way to the Bates Motel and uh we'll get more uh in in on that in a minute, but meanwhile, uh Norman who has quit his job at uh the Statler Diner <laughs> yeah. in, in Psycho <laughs> too. He he bailed on that job then so he could open up the motel and, you know, kill people. It and, didn't seem like he enjoyed it there though in the second one. Like there were times where he was very um it just didn't seem like he enjoyed that job. And yet he just goes back there. Like, Let me get a couple burgers now. Yeah, so he's going there for for dinner. Uh ahead of him arrives a reporter named uh, Tracy Venable who is doing uh, an article on basically killers who are released from prison. And she's trying to present this sort of alternate view of yes, all these people who are uh, families of the victims think that this is reprehensible, but let's hear it from the murderer's point of view. You know, is, do you think you got out with good reason do you think you should still be inside that kind of thing and so she's asking around the diner about this guy because you know her boss uh or it, norman's old boss mr statler right. is there there's um the the sheriff from psycho 2 is also there <laughs> yeah. and and their attitude is just like leave him alone you know right. like we talked li- in the last episode about how casual the police investigation of the doings of Psycho 2 were where they were like uh, it was clearly Meg Tilly and, and Lila Crane who did it all so Norman right. just got the raw en- end here and was totally yeah. innocent and so that's that's where they're operating from is that Norman paid his due to society is was innocent of, of everything that happened in Psycho 2 and just wants to be <laughs> left alone well, and not knowing that the, obviously not them knowing the events of Psycho 2 happened the way they kind of did at the end there. Um, what? Do, how do you feel about that? If, if somebody, you know, um, did something like that and then they, oh, well, they paid their dues and yet they're out like walking around now. Like, I guess it depends on the person, but is that okay? Like, I would not give that person a job still. Like, I'm sorry, but like. You're forever. You have a little scarlet letter on you. Like you are not going to be around here. Just, just by the small chance that you could fucking flip out again and kill us all. Yeah, well, I think a serial killer like Norman Bates is maybe the the exception to the rule. Like I think, <laughs> I you know, I think if you're 25 years old and you shoot somebody yeah. in a crime of passion, and you right. you serve 15 or 20 years and come out of that realizing your mistake and and so forth sort of the uh yep. morgan freeman from shawshank right right uh, you know like hey he clearly did some heinous shit when he was a kid but he's an older man now he understands what what effect that had on th- his victims and himself and all that right. kind of stuff he just grew up you know he's yes. not a stupid yes. kid anymore like i'm all for that but yeah if it's just like hey here's a serial killer who's got a fragile sanity that he's clinging to <laughs> right so let's move him back into the place where he committed his crimes <laughs> like yes that i think maybe some questions should be asked at the very least you got somebody stopping by every day to be like hey how you doing norman kill right. anybody today no good right you know <laughs> yeah and i want to say too but real quick um you know going back to the to the opening shot of the bates motel you know it's such an iconic obviously horror set piece um the motel the house the staircase in between you know um all these things it's so iconic when he's running down the stairs and all those things that opening scene that opening scene with the birds was like, it was so, oh, I didn't even think of Hitchcock the birds either. But I'm watching the <laughs> birds and I'm like, oh, I was like, all right, yeah, we're back at the Bates Motel. Oh, I was just, just happy to be here. And then the fucking bird drops and I'm like, oh, that's right. Because I, I, I had forgotten for a brief moment that he's a taxidermist, you know, he's yeah. stuffing things. So, and then, and then he rolls up with his little bag and oh man, I was just like, wow, okay. I thought that was a brilliant way to be like, hey, like, remember this place? And then like, okay, yeah, remember why we're here? 
Right, just <laughs> rampant death and, and heinous <laughs> destruction. Yeah, that, right. that's really nice. And there's also the moment where you see, like, one of the birds survives, and Norman seems kind of happy about it. Like, oh, you know, yeah. I, 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 am, I don't have the opportunity to stuff you, but also, good for you. You made it, you know? <laughs> right. And. Exactly. And so, and so, you know, there is this implication that like Norman is is feeding this appetite for murder, but yes. also isn't completely a monster, you right. know, or at right. least in regards to this. And yeah, but so when he strolls into the diner after this reporter shows up, and everybody's like, "Just leave Norman alone! Like he's just trying to murder some birds at his place <laughs> and live a decent life." <laughs> and the the reporter sits down with him and is kind of asking, you know, the, the question you were asking of like, hey, do you think you should be out? Do you think you, you should be out and about with us after murdering, you know, not just um, Mary and Crane, but there were a couple of right. women before, uh, you know, more on that in Psycho 4. Um, ah, that's right. But, uh, you know, and he's pretty quiet and then in comes Maureen Coyle who mm -hmm. looks a bit like Marion Crane yes and also has a suitcase with her initials which are also MC like Marion Crane <laughs> yeah that's a little much yeah and Norman sees this and is just like gotta go and immediately <laughs> gets up and <laughs> Like to the point where this nun is like, is there anywhere in town I could stay? Perhaps a motel, perhaps oh, right. one with a house looking over the motel itself, perhaps one run by a whisper thin older gentleman. And Norman Bates is doing his best to just get money out of his pocket, pay for his lunch, and get the fuck out of there. He wants nothing to do with this. Like, <laughs> right. you know, he in in Psycho Two. He doesn't actually kill anybody except for Mrs. Spool. And, and she deserved it. Right, well, yeah, because she was driving him crazy. And right. so, he, yes, he's living with his mother, but also, you know, because of the dichotomy of, of uh, his psychology, that he is, you know, of, of the one mind where the mother portion of his brain is just like, kill all whores. And the other <laughs> part of his brain is like I want to be a decent person like I just I yes. don't I, I want to be a good guy right and right. and and in psycho 2 that was his whole mo was like I just want to be a helpful decent human being and now I've been driven crazy by everyone around me right. um yes and so, that that's always the fun with Norman too cuz you can see it in his eyes too like he's fighting it all the time and in this scene, it's like, how hard do you think his dick was as he was running out of there? Like, he was just so, oh my god, her MC, get me the fuck out of here! Yeah, well, yeah that's, you know, uh, as always, that is the problem. As soon as he starts feeling any kind of sexual attraction, that's where the mother part of his brain kicks in. Right. And is like, no, Norman, you have to kill anyone that makes you erect. And It's funny that you say that, too, because it's weird... I how how sex driven this movie really is like it's all about sex in one way or another well for sure but i mean the original was too it's you know right. that, that is right. that is the thing that drives norman is as soon as he feels a connection or sexual attraction to a woman that woman is probably gonna die you know like <laughs> psycho 2 is all about him living with meg tilly and getting a hard on for her, and right. he, he doesn't kill her directly but he's gonna you know right. like if, <laughs> if, if, yeah if the cops hadn't stepped in he was gonna straight up murder her and right. <laughs> and it was because you know the mother part of his brain sees a woman as you know a sexual rival Horse. yeah, yeah. Right, get that slut out of my house. That's the notes <laughs> that that she leaves, uh, you know, for Norman. And right. so, yeah, so you know, all of this is just sexual compulsion and and him killing anything that he is attracted to. Right. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So it. So ultimately, she does show up at this diner. 
or not diner, but uh, at the Bates Motel. The motel, yep. And um, Norman has hired Jeff Fahey to Duke uh, to be the, his assistant manager. Yeah. And yes. and like Duke's car has broken down, and he wants to work for just enough time so that he can repair his car, put a little money in his pocket, so he can move on to L.A. where he can, you know, strike his fortune as a musician. And, right. you know, Norman is trying to rehabilitate the motel. They say uh, early on, like, hey, yes, this is out of the way, but there's more traffic on the road than there has been. We're yeah. having a big, uh, like, homecoming party at the motel, or a bunch of people are, are renting rooms at the hotel to celebrate this uh, homecoming victory. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's where our, you know, our fodder comes in. And, I, I like that, though. I, I like that addition to it. It's like, oh, okay, like, you know, the, these are the things going on. Because it is a small town, but you... It, it, you feel like it's very much like one of those highway towns too, where it is right off the highway, and and you you would get that group of people um, in that area. Also, I do love that line between him and Jeff A, where he's like, "I don't plan on staying around for a while." He's like, "Nobody ever does." Yeah, <laughs> great line. Yeah. Uh, so when Mary, uh, not Mary and Crane, not, uh, Maureen Coyle rolls up on the motel sure enough there is jeff a he and he's like yeah 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 sorry about all the attempted rape i promise i'm not yeah. gonna do that again <laughs> right now do you okay with with that like would you feel safe with that dude like if you were a woman like w would that be okay to you or would you just be like red flag like i'm out of here because like she really doesn't have that too many options <laughs> these is before cell phone days you know she's like you said she's got her suitcase which is now all muddy thanks to jeff fahey because he threw it out of the car but uh you know it, she, she doesn't have many options do you think she was just like i don't want to because this guy's a complete creep and he tried to rape me but i have no other options so i might as well well and also she's incredibly <laughs> self-destructive so I think there's part of that too, where she's just like, ah, kind of who cares? Like, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be alive come morning anyway. So, you know, right? Yeah. If if he's a necrophiliac, I guess good for him. Right. She's like, I'm going to die one way or another, whether he fucking kills me or I kill myself. Right. Oh, oh, there's Norman too, though. There's Norman. So I got options. Well, and and Norman is kind to her but also gives her the creepiest look that has ever been given to another human being where he's just yes. seeing her as Marion Crane and his mouth is doing a frown smile that is going between the two at a at a rate of like a hummingbird's wings <laughs> where he just can't decide how he feels about this woman where it's like I want on the one hand I want to fuck her for sure on the right. other hand I don't want to kill her and I'm afraid if she stays I'm going to and he gets real pissed off when right. he discovers that uh, Jeff A has given her cabin number one <laughs> yeah, because like, he's, of all cabins Jeff yeah like what are you doing that's you know <laughs> that's like putting a sheet cake in front of me it's like right. you know I don't want to eat it but here it is uh, hey, you I'm, just got out of rehab. Here's some heroin. That's right? It. Yeah, it's uh, very much so. It's just like you are you are giving <laughs> your killer the the meat that he most wants, and <laughs> yeah. uh, so Norman is trying to be cool about it. But of course, mother is like, "You need to kill that whore in cabin number one." And so he, that's what happens. Like, mother shows up late at night at cabin number one. Yeah, and. Uh, unfortunately, when he pulls back the, the shower curtain, a la the, the first movie, and there's a lot of similar shots to the first shower sequence in Psycho. Yes. Um, he pulls it back, though, and Norman discovers, or mother discovers, that Maureen Coyle has cut her wrist. So her bathtub is already filled with blood. Uh, blood is pumping out of her wrist from the razor blades uh, 
run across those wrists. Yeah, and <laughs> more interestingly, Maureen Coyle looks up, and because she is dying from, you know, loss of blood, she sees uh, the essentially the Virgin Mary not holding a butcher knife, but instead holding a crucifix. Yes. And yes. so this <laughs> subverts mother, and the next thing you know, uh, Norman Bates has has called the hospital, called the, called the ambulance, and Maureen Coyle is now in a hospital room where uh, she is being treated and, and nursed back to help, and Norman shows up at her bedside and says, look, you can stay at the Bates Motel, FOC, free of charge. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, which I really like. Uh, you you can stay at the Bates Motel as long as you need to recover, and <laughs> and I would argue this is him actually saying for himself. You know, fortunately, we dodged a bullet with Mother killing you. Right. We'll right. put we'll put you in a cabin that isn't cabin number one, <laughs> so that yeah. I don't like peep through the wall at you getting naked. Right. And right. Uh, and and you can nurse back to health, and in that way, you can redeem yourself. I can redeem myself. Everybody's uh, cool. I never thought of that, but yeah, I got yeah, yeah, for sure. That makes sense too. And and also too, though, you know, I never once thought that it's you know it's kind of mother infiltrating. Like you you know when mother's there trying to make decisions for Norman. Like, when it's just Norman, it's just Norman. And it is interesting to see how he plans on trying to avoid all this by, while simultaneously inviting her back to the hotel. Like, it, it's almost like, yeah, I, like, he, he wants redemption and, and that way she can get redemption as well. But at the same time, like, everybody's just like, oh, man. Like, are you, like, really? Like, are we, Norman. Like he should know better. He should know that even even though he trusts in himself and he wants to he wants to change, like that shit ain't gonna happen, bro. Like that, she's gonna die. Yeah, it's a real like the road to hell is paved with good intentions kind of thing where right. he he doesn't mean to. Not only does he not mean her any harm, he desperately wants to do the right thing here. Yes, it's yes. just he's not. Yeah, you know, capable psychologically of doing this. Um, one one quick thing I want to point out. Uh, this is just because uh, I think that it's hilarious and and shows what a shitball Jeff A he is. Is when he's initially renting her the room. There's a big to do made of Jeff A he saying to Norman before Maureen Coyle ever shows up. Like, all right, the rooms are twenty ninety five for a single, twenty five ninety five for a double. When Maureen Coyle shows up, Jeff Fahey is like, oh, it's twenty five ninety five for a single. Oh. And okay. And he pockets the five dollars. Right. <laughs> of course he does. Yeah, because he's <laughs> yeah. just a shitball. Right. <laughs> exactly. And <laughs> and so speaking of Jeff Fahey, while while everything between Maureen Coyle and Norman Bates is happening, Duke ends up going to a bar, um, and meets uh, Tracy Venable, uh, yep. the the reporter who is not interested in him until he says that he works at the Bates Motel, and she basically says like I just give me the scoop like if you see anything weird there let me know, and right. he's like yeah 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 I'm here to get laid lady, and so he picks up a, a girl named Red, yeah, takes her back to the motel they fog. Mm -hmm. and uh in again just to show what a complete piece of garbage that R duke is after they fuck and he's already by the way the room that norman gave him to stay in he's already got a collage of porn mag pictures taped to the wall oh he's home now yeah this is his home <laughs> for the next week <laughs> yeah it, you know makes himself at home by like cutting out centerfolds and it's <laughs> it's just did you ever crazy. do that did you ever do that as a young man did you ever like cut out swimsuit models and, and put them on your wall no i like no, I, I, right? I had 
you know, I had my share of porn mags, but they stayed in the closet where they belonged until I needed them. I wasn't, right. I wasn't trying to celebrate my perversity. I know people to this day, grown men, that, that will, will get pictures of, like, Alexandra Daddario and just put her, put her on your wall. And, like, while I appreciate, like, her body, like, why is that on your wall, bro? Like, is that, what? What's happening here? Like, there's a difference between memorabilia and this is kind of creepy. Yeah, everyone just needs to rewatch the Michael Rappaport scene from the movie Beautiful Girls about oh. about why he has pictures of beautiful women on his wall. And also the <laughs> yes. Timothy Hutton reaction of like, all right, if that's, <laughs> if that's yes. what gets you through the night. But he also, like... <laughs> The moral lesson of that in the movie is like, well, those are all just fantasies of women and, and real women right. aren't, aren't, not only are they not airbrushed like that, but it's like, pay attention to the woman that you're with and don't yes. worry about jerking off to, you know, Alexandra D- Daddario or whatever. Like, pay, <laughs> pay attention right. to the person that uh, you ought to be, you know, sexually attracted to or whatever. Right. It, no you're right (laughs) it's one of the like that stuff drives me crazy of like what must your wife think about this of just it it is just such a slap in the face you know well that's assuming that they have wives and or girlfriends in the first place right well and the (laughs) yes the so section b of that argument is you are not going to get a girlfriend and or wife (laughs) by plastering (laughs) images of models and beautiful movie stars on your walls and be like yeah this is what i crank it to because that's why you have it right yeah yeah i I always met dudes like that though that were always like so so upfront about how sexual they were and it's just like first of all like calm down bro second of all has i i never believed for a second that that actually worked for them and and th- these are the same dudes that do have these pictures on their walls and stuff like that. And I'm just like, how, in what alternate universe, like, is this not only acceptable, but, like, attractive, you know, for women? Like, how would you ever once walk into that dude's room and be like, oh, this guy, yeah, 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 he, he's... He's in touch with something deep here. <laughs> like what? And then those same people, though, growing up as as a you know a, a thirty seven year old male now, it's like yeah, it makes perfect sense. They're all still very, very, very single. Yeah, well, it it, it is literally objectifying women. That's it. And yeah. I just don't know a lot of women who are like you know what I'm really into completely being objectified and and having like all my hopes and fears and everything that makes up my personality (laughs) just thrown out the window so long as they're hot. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You know, and I, I'm sure that there are women out there that exist. I mean, there's an entire pornography industry that I'm sure is, uh, largely made up of women who are not necessarily concerned with a deep interior life and so (laughs) forth. But, right. eh, you know, it, it it just speaks ill of a man that Thank does you. that. Uh, but, I, I totally agree. <laughs> but to, <laughs> you know, but it's also Jeff Fahey's character because after they fuck and he is just holding a lamp and swinging it in front of his dick <laughs> to throw I, a spotlight on, on this girl Red that he had sex with. Uh and, you know, I guess just to be like, hey, this is what Motley Crue videos look like or something. And she's like, you know, this isn't all that sexy. Uh, how about, you know, how about we, you know, like cuddle or whatever she says. And he's just yeah. like, how about you get the fuck out? <laughs> and that's what I was going to get to, too. It's like, here we are talking about, like, minute details of Duke. But, yeah overall like those that's will hang in fruit like he's doing way worse shit <laughs> yeah he's he's so gross uh but it, right but it's in a fun way like i like jeff Hay- yeah. fahey playing a complete dirtbag like this same but yep. yeah so he just kicks her out of uh the motel in nothing but her panties and then she has to bang on the door so that he will literally throw the rest of her clothes and purse in her face 
and shut the door. And so she is clearly upset and goes to, uh, 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 you know, she goes to the the local payphone um, to call a cab. And Mm -hmm. then mother shows up because there's (laughs) there's a whore on the grounds. Right. Oh, like you think she's just waiting. Like, oh, popped out of this room with titties out. Like, let's go. Right. Go to work. Yeah. And so and and she and Norman had like a brief encounter at one point where, you know, again, she's a pretty woman. And as soon as Norman feels attraction, that's where mother kicks in is like, Norman, you're going to have to kill that slut. Well, let me ask you a question, though. That actually brings up a good point, because it's like, you know, she's going to uh, make a phone call and stuff like that. How long do you think Norman takes to to dress up? Because, again, like we said, like, she, he had to have been watching. Was Mother just waiting? Like, what was it yeah. her? Wait, it had to have been, right? In costume, just waiting for something to pop off. Yeah, I think so. I think at a certain point, like whenever that mother persona took over, and it was probably right after he saw right. this woman, oh, right. mother takes right. over and he's he's all dressed up. And, yeah. you know, as they point out in the first movie, this isn't just because he's, you know, a cross-dresser. It's just that mother, when mother takes over, mother puts on her clothes. and. Yes. So, yeah, I imagine that mother's kind of keeping an eye on what's going on in the motel. And right. Yeah, she's because- got to gotta be dressed ready to go. Yeah, well, and mother, as a character, and, and what we know of her from the, the first movies, mother loves Norman, but also thinks that Norman is incompetent. <laughs> a little pussy, yeah. Yeah, and so she is probably <laughs> yeah. keeping an eye on the motel because she knows that some business is afoot that she doesn't approve of. And it, yeah, so she's probably kind of yeah. watching out. It's a good point. Yep. And, but yeah, sure enough. And it, it, it's a pretty good moment where, uh, mother like smashes through one of the panes of glass in the phone booth and opens it up and stabs red to death. And, uh, I like that after that, you see bandages on Norman's hand from yeah. doing that yep. and he never comments on it no one ever asks him about it it's just i, I right. like the fact that the movie cared enough to be like oh yes. from here on in the movie he's gonna have bandages on his fingers from that uh, right to let us know like there is no doubt in this movie unlike the other films there is no doubt that norman is mother and mother is killing these people it seems like anthony perkins uh as an actor as a person would have that attention to detail and care about those those kind of th- those are big things you know those yeah. are big things we were just talking about this the other night uh, uh brian had mentioned um how the gutter was broken in uh the new halloween movie you know when it came through and smashed the window in the in the first movie and stuff like that and i would have never picked up on that but that attention to detail for me, goes so far if you're a fan of these movies. So if you're a fan of continuity, and especially it's not even from one movie to the next, it's just the next scene in this case, um, I think all that stuff is so important. It's it's probably the most important things because, yeah, a lot of people could easily look past it, but if you notice it, again, like, you know, like kind of we're talking right now, we know that there was there was time and 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 thought behind it. It's very thought out. It's very um, obviously. It's very intentional. Yeah, it's one of those things. I like the expression. You may not notice it, but your brain does. Where if it weren't there, it would feel like something was off. Yes. And, and you might not yes. recognize what it was, but there would be something at the back of your mind that would be like something's not quite right here. Um, right. and yep. and so yeah it's that attention to detail again that just shows that somebody gave a shit about the movie enough uh, to to you know cover those bases and right. all right so then uh in the wake of red being murdered <laughs> uh the next day the hotel or motel let's be honest motel is now filled up with the locals and or visiting people here for the homecoming celebration the third act. Yes. Everybody is here. <laughs> and our reporter goes to Mrs. Spool's apartment 
because another little touch I like is that there are signs everywhere uh, about Mrs. Bull being missing. Yes. Yes. And, and, I love that. And Mr. Uh, the diner owner, Statler, even talks about, like, at the beginning of the movie, how, right. you know, she never missed a day of work in five years or whatever. And, you know, it, she's yeah. been gone for 30 days. Nobody knows where the hell she is. And so <laughs> Tracy is goes, the, our reporter goes into the, the, her, uh, her rented room. Yeah, and finds a magazine where Mrs. Spool has written the number to the base motel over and over and over again on and inside this magazine. Mm -hmm. And so then we cut to night one of the uh, homecoming festivities where we have uh, everybody's out celebrating. There's... um, a, a woman whose name is Patsy is uh, is she kind of flirts with Norman a little bit, right? And yep. again, that means that she's got to die. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes, and and that's what happens. She ends up being murdered by mother again. Yep. And uh, there there's a nice moment where after she's murdered and Norman discovers the body left by mother uh that yeah he's got to hide the body and so he's gonna dump the body in the the newly renovated ice machine that they've got right but before he could do that some people pass by uh and so he stands the body up and stands with it like they're kind of making out (laughs) yep yep and like what the one of the homecoming guests is like, hey, somebody's getting lucky at least, and then they run past him. But anyway, yeah, so he dumps the body in the the um, the ice machine. <laughs> the new one. Yeah. <laughs> He's and, so happy about it. And, and so the next day, uh, the sheriff and the deputy show up because they're like, hey, all those people who were here for the homecoming, they didn't notice it when they were leaving, but this girl Patsy is missing. And have you seen anything about this, uh, Norman? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's crazy. (laughs) And so the sheriff opens up the ice machine. Yeah. And Norman looks down and sure enough, there is like this girl's face staring (laughs) up from the ice. And the sheriff (laughs) grabs some ice out of the ice machine and starts sucking on it. Yeah. Um, and grabs some bloody ice too. Yes. And he that's did. that's a point where I was like, "All right, he would have a okay. tasted this, and Thank b you. as he's sucking his fingers after eating the eyes, right. would clearly notice. Like, why is my hand all bloody? Yeah, and and to add on to that, like, okay, you you're investigating something. Who just goes in and grabs ice and puts it in the mouth? He did it all like slobby and just like it was like coming out of his mouth, dribbling. Bro, what are you doing? Like, you're a professional. Like, I get it. It's a small town. But have some respect for yourself. Like, what are we, the cops from Halloween 5? Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, it is. Like, he's eating, like, popcorn or something. It's just, <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you doing? That's not how you eat ice. It's like one cube. You suck on it for a second. Maybe you crush it up, and then you swallow it. Done and done. Throw it in ice cubes like fucking sesame seeds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's you know, like, like Norman eats candy corn. Right, exactly. Oh, good, good reference. And <laughs> so, anyway, they're satisfied. They take all. He's like, "Yeah, you look around if you want, Sheriff. She's not here." And he's like, "All right, Norman, we're just checking with you. Thanks for being sane and not killing people." Right. And uh, so during this time, also, like Norman and Marine Coil have been like engaged in this burgeoning romance between the two of them where yes. they, you know and there's a lot of talk about you know they both have uh these difficult paths and they're wrestling with things and that maybe they can both find some happiness and and so forth and right. this all comes to a pretty quick end when the reporter shows up and yes. tells Maureen Coyle she's like hey did you know that Norman has a trouble past? And she's like, oh, yes. He said there were some things that he's not happy about. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know those yeah. were murders? <laughs> horrifying. <laughs> horrifying, <laughs> gruesome murders. 
and he's got a split personality with his fucking mother. Like what? Yeah, and at that point, Maureen Coyle is like, "Oh no, I didn't know that." <laughs> I'm probably going to go back to the convent for a couple of days. So the reporter's like, I think that's a great idea. Right. We all do. Yeah. And so she goes back there and there, there's a conversation between her and the priest about whether, like why she took the vows when she did. And right. maybe that was a mistake. And she feels like she has uh, all these things to experience. And, you know, much like Norman, she is sort of afraid of her own sexuality and yes. ran from it. Like she, and Norman, murdered people and she just ran to the convent neither one of them can be horny around another person without losing their shit right or throwing nuns off yeah yeah and meanwhile norman um goes to find mother who is missing and instead finds a note that says uh norman come find me i'm in cabin number 12 now, when you saw that, what did you think? Were you like, oh, shit, here we go, part two again? <laughs> yeah, kind of. And I think that was the the point is like, right. oh, this is like Norman moved his mother and then wrote himself a note as mother to say, come yes. get me and hide me. Right, right, exactly, yeah. But that's not the case. It's that Jeff Fahey has figured all this shit out because he heard Norman arguing with himself up in the house. Yep. And has gone into the house and discovered mother. And he's like, look, man, I'm not here to, to blow up your shit. You want to keep running out of a motel and murdering people? That's fine. It just Cut means, me. yeah, you're just going <laughs> to pay for the yeah. right to do that. Right. And right. So he's a douchebag. He's a he's not a murderer. He, he is a sleazeball who throws girls out basically topless and like, hey, fuck you. And he'll blackmail people, and he's always kind of looking at, at the next con, right? Like, that's why he probably moves from town to town, because he sets it on fire as he leaves every time. You know, he's one of those type of people. We've all met him. Yeah. You know, they're just a shit storm of a person. And it's like, oh, I can't even deal with this person for, like, more than a day. Like, you know, I've met people at bars where I'm just like, all right, like, that 10 minutes with that person, I, n- I hope I never see them again. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, though, that because I thought that for for a while that, that they were going to kind of um, go the atypical route of like he would be doing some of the killing, too, or like he was involved with the kill. No, he's just a sleazebag. And I like that. Yeah. So, yeah, he is just a piece of human garbage. And he is. <laughs> Norman then takes Duke's guitar and beats the ever living fuck out of him with his own guitar, which I appreciate. Well, not before throwing an ashtray at his fucking head. Oh, that is so good. He it's... throws he throws that <laughs> ashtray like a ninja star. It is the best. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. What a odd way to do it though no we're just no fuck you we just do the like i was like did that just happen yeah like i i don't know why i just love that moment i can't pinpoint why but it was awesome and this is another one of those moments i really like it. i love the lighting <laughs> in this movie but this is another moment where jeff a he seems to have replaced every bulb in the uh the room with a red one with a red one yes it was like a dark room yeah oh it looks so good but yeah so norman you know be- beats him into unconsciousness with his guitar and then uh decides to do uh, the old faithful which is put duke along with this girl patsy into the car and then he's going to push it into the swamp like he does you know when you got to get rid of a body or two worked the first time like a charm oh wait yeah, I mean, like, even in Psycho 2, we're finding bodies dumped in, in uh, the swamp. And right. so, in yeah, Psycho 3, he's just like, you know what? No one will ever suspect the swamp. <laughs> right. No, it, lightning might strike twice, but it's never going to strike a third time. <laughs> They'll never catch me. Right, that's the perfect crime. So... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, with this sheriff, sheriff's department, you could be like, 
Sheriff, why on earth would I, a man who knows you're going to check the swamp to see if I killed somebody, put a body right. in the swamp? Clearly it's not me. You know what, Norman? That's a good point. No killer would be that stupid. I got a cup of ice for you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah. I'll give you a <laughs> discount on, on the next time you need a room. Well, Norman, that's awful nice of you. <laughs> but that's a good point, though. He is so stupid that like you could see him actually getting away with it because, yeah, uh, Barney Fife over here, you know? Yeah, and it's something that, you know, Venom and I talked about in the first two movies as well. Like, Norman Bates is not a master criminal. He is not a great, like, he, he's right. terrible at covering up his crimes. Horrible. Yeah, right. and not really that great at committing them. Like, it's messy, and yeah, it's not, <laughs> like, yeah. He, he's, he's just a psychopath. He doesn't think about uh, what he's doing until he's in the middle of doing it right exactly and, and so yeah so he like duke wakes up for a second and and for a moment there they end up going into the swamp together but norman finally gets out of the car and duke drowns yep and so <laughs> jeff a he meets the fate that uh quite frankly is too good for him drowning is too good for duke but yes that's what happens so <laughs> meanwhile uh our reporter goes back to the diner owner Statler to ask him some more questions about Mrs. Spool. And it turns out that she was working at the diner before Statler ever bought it. And so she then follows that breadcrumb trail to a guy named Leach, who is the previous owner of the diner who now is, you know, essentially, uh, is suffering from dementia or alzheimer's or something he's just super old and old man rivers yeah yeah right just you know time <laughs> exists all at once for him and he's like a kurt vonnegut character yes yes and um but she, he tells her oh yeah mrs bull was also in the giggle factory on account of murder and right. she's like aha yeah i I've, I've discovered a clue and so while she's on the trail of Mrs. Spool, Maureen Coyle decides, oh, I don't really want to be a nun. Norman is my true love. I'm going back to the hotel. She's like, that way I can get some dick, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and so she goes back to the motel and goes back to the house. Yep. And there's she like runs up the stairs to meet Norman and they're having this conversation about like, we can both be free of our past. We just need to get the fuck out of here and be together. <laughs> and while this is happening, mother is yelling in Norman's ear, AKA his brain. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> he like, uh, he doesn't push her or anything. He just kind of stumbles with her. Yeah. And Maureen Coyle ends up losing her balance and goes down the staircase, much like Arbogast from the original movie. Arbogast. Yeah. Only instead of just falling in a heap at the bottom of the stairs dead, she goes back of the head first into a statue of Cupid driving the arrow <laughs> Cupid is holding into the base of her skull and and then she falls down dead. What a part three move. Yeah. Let's wrap it up, guys. <laughs> right. Hey, what's worse oh, wow. than falling down the stairs? Falling down the <laughs> stairs into a fucking stone arrow. <laughs> like, everything about that, like, oh, cool, nice little fall. Oh, really? Oh, wow. They just did that. Okay. Yeah. But I don't hate it, though. See, that's the thing. Like, I love slashes. I love stupid shit and stupid kills like that. And while it it did feel like a little tacked on, like, well, we're in part three, kids. We really got to amp it up. Um, I, I, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it. Yeah, I, I don't either. I think it's a nice nod to the first. I like both the shower stuff and this. There are yep. a handful, and there, there's some other stuff too, um, right. where they nod to the cinematography of the first movie and the, the vibe of the first movie. But it's right. never, it doesn't feel like you're just ripping it off. It just feels like, yeah, this is a tip of the hat and not yes. just mimicking that movie. Uh, because, I can agree more. Yep. Yeah, because yep. this is still doing its own thing, 
And um, sure. so Norman is pissed off at mother for causing the death of the woman that maybe would have saved him. Right. But then Tracy, our reporter, shows up, sees Maureen dead on the floor, <laughs> looks up, and there's Norman, now dressed as mother, holding... Looking so crazy. Yeah, yeah, hold, <laughs> holding the knife. And there's a whole bit where she's like, hey, before you kill me, I've got a lot of exposition. So, a ton. <laughs> yeah, so it turns out Emma Spool was your aunt, but she was in love with your uh, your father, but your father married uh, Mrs. Spool's sister, Norma, and that's why, like, crazy Emma Spool said she was your mother, oh, but yeah. she never was. Right. Like, your mother was your mother, not Emma Spool, and that Emma Spool was the one who killed Norman's father and then kidnapped Norman for a while when he was a kid. Yes. And then when she got caught and then sent to the booby hatch, Norman was then <laughs> returned to his mother, and that's when Mrs. Bull went into the institution. These names for the fucking institution are just <laughs> well, the Giggle House. Yeah. Like all... <laughs> G- yeah, the Giggle Factory is my personal favorite. That is... <laughs> That is the thing I will I, I will never not be able to. And what's worse is my girlfriend is a behavioral nurse. Like, she works in a behavioral oh, right, right, union. Right. And, it's still fun. And I don't think she appreciates the fact that I do not take mental institutions. Or I think that alternate names for mental institutions are funny. Um, right. I don't. Like, they all do the good work and all that kind of thing. And, and, and God knows she is uh, a saint for the work that she oh, does. Oh, yeah. But absolutely, I will. But that's hilarious. I will never. I will never not find Giggle Factory funny. <laughs> you know, it's like farts. I I'm always gonna right. laugh at a fart. It just <laughs> till the day I die. Yeah, so. I'm never gonna be so grown up that I don't think that's funny. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so so we we kind of undo the reveal of the second movie, right? And now, um mother descends on Tracy but instead of killing her because you know you hear mother's voice like kill her kill her kill the slut and uh, he chases her into the bedroom where the reporter discovers oh here is the corpse of mother aka Mrs. Spool and Norman tries to get the dress off and Instead of killing Tracy when he pulls up the knife, he ends up stabbing Mrs. Spool's corpse a bunch. Yep. And Didn't expect that. Yeah, it's, you know, again, he finally kind of frees himself from, right. you know, mother's influence. And the, the, the end of the movie is the sheriff showing up. And now that he has m- enough evidence, a.k.a. a dead body on the floor, mother... Or Norman kind of half dressed up like mother, as well as the corpse of Mrs. Spool and the eyewitness testimony of the reporter. Now he's like, wait a second, maybe there is something going on with Norman. Right. <laughs> hmm. Crack squad, CSI Fairview finally leaping into action. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And- and, and that's the thing too. It's like I I am glad that 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 finally came to a head because how many movies can you really go without it being ridiculous? And I think this was teetering on it, but because everything kind of did happen the way it did at the end of this movie, it's like okay, yeah, that's a nice wrap wrapping up of that. Yeah, or the, or or the laws way to deal with Norman. And their inability to to see that he's a psycho from day one, like because I feel like a lot of people are like that. Like they're so quick to like, well, we'll just look the other way, you know. And then shit goes down. Okay, like I get it. Like I know I I, I didn't see it the first time in the ice, but now I get it. Man, my <laughs> maybe my favorite part of this movie, I, actually, probably my favorite part yeah. of this movie, is the scene where he's going to cabin twelve. There's a great like tracking shot of Norman yep. walking down the uh, th- that sort of alley in front yes. of the 
motel rooms and kind of pushing streamers out of the way. Just a beautiful shot, and I, I love it to death. Maybe the second favorite thing about this movie Agreed. is this moment where the sheriff is like, Norman, I can't tell you how disappointed we all are. We thought you were okay. <laughs> And now you're never going to get out of the institution again. Are you Are you happy? Are you proud of yourself, Norman? I like the fact that it's like, I'm not angry, Norman. I'm just disappointed. Just disappointed. <laughs> yes. I love it. I absolutely love it. I, yeah, this sheriff, man. I mean, I hope I get pulled over by this guy. The most understanding, I- <laughs> lenient sheriff in the history of police force. He'd be like, hey, son, I uh, I found all this booze that I confiscated, all this marijuana. Uh, I can't take it back. Would you take it for me? Like, he's that cop. Yeah. Like, you know, the old stories about, like, back in the 70s when somebody would pull you over for a DUI instead of writing you a ticket or taking you to jail, they just take you home. You know? Right. It's, that's the <laughs> sheriff who's like, well, you know, you're dangerously intoxicated behind the wheel. Let me get you home. Uh, deputy, right. be sure you follow me in his car so it'll be there when he wakes up tomorrow. Uh, right. And that's definitely not the rep that most cops have today. Here's the thing, though, about police officers and, and people in positions like that, though. In so many movies, you've seen so many more horrible iterations of these characters because of their bad decision making, because of so many bad reasons that this one in relation, like actually step T- taking a step back and looking it's really not that bad and not that unbelievable either <laughs> yeah well he is he's a small town sheriff right. you know like the yeah. idea is that he probably knows everybody in town and he's not he out to get ways. him yeah right yes exactly yep. so but i i do love how <laughs> just norman 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 how how could you have murdered all those people? I'm really I'm really disappointed in you. Can't believe you did that, Norman. Yeah, and Norman says, "Well, I'll be free. I'll finally be free." And then he, they load him in the back of the squad car, and the movie was supposed to end there. Yep. But the studio insisted like, "Well, we've got to have an out in case this movie makes a lot of money and we right. and we need to do another sequel." And so it turns out that Norman has slipped into his coat pocket the severed hand of uh, the taxidermied Mrs. Spool, which he caresses uh, in the back of the squad car, which I'm sure when they get to the police station and find this, they're going to be very upset. Well, unless he put it somewhere else where they couldn't find. Oh, right. Right. I, 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 I smuggled her hand in the one place I knew they'd never look. My ass. How's that for an after credit scene? Right. Yeah, it's it's just that <laughs> Pulp Fiction walk-in scene, only instead of a watch, it's Mrs. Poole's hand. <laughs> I wore Mrs. Poole's hand up my ass all the way to the Giggle Factory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and so there ends uh, Psycho 3. Um, yep. And, you know, one thing I didn't really mention a lot of as we were talking about it in in relation to kind of callbacks to the original movie, there's a lot of nice shots where Norman is framed with birds of prey behind him. Uh, that is very similar to the first movie. Um, you know, we talked about a lot of the mirror images in this movie to the first film. Right. And, and also, I, I kind of like the fact that they're just like, that Mrs. Bullshit, we don't like it. We're just going to totally change it and undo it. Right. Um, Does and, it take away from it, though, the, the ending in second? Um, yeah, but also the the end of the second movie isn't my favorite thing about that. So the right. fact that they are mm-hmm. they kind of dismiss it and say, like, mm-hmm. oh, no, that's Emma Spool was just crazy. And, you know, she got you crazy again but also she was never really your mother um i don't mind that you know and also like this movie doesn't really do a lot with the mythology of psycho the lore of the story except for this you know otherwise it's just norman doing norman shit and i don't i don't mind it being like oh we're gonna kind of undo some of the second part but also there was a little bit of 
eh, fleshing ar- out around the edges of, you know, you were you were taken away by this woman when you were a child and maybe right. like they don't say it directly, but maybe that had something to do with the way that you grew up and your fixations over your mother and who your mother is and uh, right. that kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't mind it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think it adds a new layer. But again, at the end of the day, it's just, like you said, it's just Norman doing Norman shit. So it doesn't really change anything in the end. Yeah. Um, so a couple of performances I would point out in, in Psycho 3 that I really enjoyed. We talked about Jeff Ahe, who yeah. is just a trashy delight. Fantastic. He, yep. He's so much fun in this. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I really like him in this a lot. I think Anthony Perkins is, he's just, as I've watched these movies, you know, yeah. all in a row and, and in relatively short order, uh, I huh? really love Anthony Perkins as Norman Bates. Uh, right? It, he's amazing, man. He's, you know, it's funny. I'm watching it and and I hadn't watched the first two, but I, I've seen them enough now and I watched them in the past, uh, I'd say, year, year and a half. So they were semi-fresh in my memory, right? But every time he would do something like, you know, kind of that like extraordinary in his acting or whatever, I'm like, damn, he's good. And then he he does another little thing. And it's all these little mannerisms or little expressions or the way he'll say a line. And it's amazing how good the acting was from him back then. You know, I I watch a movie now today and it's not, obviously this isn't indicative of all actors and, and stuff like that, but I'm watching it and it just seems so thin. It just seems like, we're going through the motions and, and with quick edits, it kind of gets buried and so many things get lost with movies like this. It hangs on their emotions. You see all the little mannerisms, you see all of that. And it, it just really does enhance and enrich, you know, watching these actors do their thing, uh, you know, watching these kind of older movies. And with this, with Anthony Perkins directing too, I I just love that. I love that he had, you know, obviously creative control over everything. And I don't know, it just feels like it feels right. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Yeah. He he inhabits that role so well that, yeah, I mean, there, you can't imagine anyone else doing it. Like we'll talk about it in the next episode on, on psycho four, but having somebody else step into those shoes it, it just the, the little mannerisms and, and like the slight stutter when he says yeah. certain things and that kind of thing. It's just like Anthony Perkins is the only person who can do that the way that Anthony Perkins does it. Exactly. And uh, can I tell my Anthony Perkins story really quick? And uh, well, now is <laughs> neither it, the time nor the place, Dan. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Of <laughs> course, go ahead. <laughs> I figured since we're on Anthony Perkins. No, uh, so my my grandfather was, was in the service. He was coming home, driving home uh, from, from wherever, and uh, he had picked up a hitchhiker, and it was none other than Anthony Perkins. Uh, start of a horror movie? Absolutely, but not so much because he said he was, like, the nicest guy ever. He drove, and he asked for his address, for my grandfather's address. He said... You know, I'd like to give you some money for helping me out with the ride and everything. He's like, it's not necessary. He's like, just give me your address. And he's like, this guy isn't going to send me anything, obviously, whatever. And sure enough, he got a check in the mail from Anthony Perkins uh, about a month or two later uh, for a substantial amount of money, too. But uh, to my grandfather, basically thanking him for the ride home that time. Wow. Nice. I was like, please tell me you have that check. Because it, it was my grandmother telling me the story. I was like, please tell me you have that check somewhere. She's like, oh, I don't know. It might be up in the attic. I spent two hours looking through old papers in the attic just by the off chance that it might be up there. Unfortunately, it was not. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's that's so good, though. And it's, you know, you like I've heard conflicting reports of Anthony Perkins as, as to whether or not like working with him was was good on set like oh. Mick Garris kind of complained about him on Halloween 4 or not Halloween Psycho 4 but right. everything else I've heard about him has been really good like the reports coming off of Psycho 3 were that like the cast and crew thought he was a delight and yeah um it was either during this shoot or shortly thereafter that he discovered he was HIV positive yeah. um yeah 
and so you know maybe maybe that had an element uh, of uh, or had an effect on how Mick Garris perhaps uh, perceived him. You know, like dealing with your mortality is a heavy thing, and maybe Anthony Perkins right. wasn't a hundred percent dialed in to. Uh, being in a movie when he was like, well, I need to go undergo these HIV treatments so I don't fucking die. Um, <laughs> exactly. Maybe. Yeah. I, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think, I think he's terrific uh, in, in this. I think Hugh Gillen returning as the sheriff, even though he is Ooh. the dopiest uh, of police officers, I think he's really fun and has this yes. kind of good natured vibe to him that I really like. Right. Right. I agree. I agree. He adds he adds an element to the movie where it, it keeps it grounded and it kind of, in an odd way, it makes you feel safe because we know this town. Like, we've been in this this part of the world before and we've even been down the street, uh, you know, at the diner and all these places. So it's nice to sometimes have characters that are all kind of like not a set piece, but they act as like the glue kind of to the story in a way yeah um no. yeah it, and he's a lot of fun the only other performance i would highlight here and unlike the the three that i mentioned that i really like um i would point out diana scarwood as maureen coyle yep. i think she's yep. a little histrionic in this i don't think that she's great um if if right. there is a low spot in the performances for me i think it's her which is unfortunate yep. because she's in so much of the movie Right. Um, right. You know, I don't think she's god awful or anything. Like she, she can perform. I it, it, like. It's just. It's a very big performance. And- I think you know just as well as I do too, though, that there was potential there. So she could have elevated it and really knocked that performance out of the park. I don't think that she did that, but I thought that that's not to say it in a derogatory way, like her performance is bad by any stretch. It wasn't. It was on par. It was. It was solid. It was good. I just felt like it could have been possibly could have been great. Yeah, especially when you're across the table from Anthony Perkins, <laughs> right. doing what Anthony Perkins do. It, it just highlights. <laughs> Like, if you are not at that level, if you're not bringing your A game, then yeah. it, it's he's just going to overwhelm you in the scene. And there were times where I was like, I just, I feel like Anthony Perkins is great in this, and I think she's okay. Right. Yep. Yeah. You're right, though. It's hard to kind of hold a candle to that. So, uh, shit. Any other performances uh, you want to point out? Um, You know, it's... <sighs> I liked everybody in this movie. It felt very cohesive, you know, um, pinpoint, no. But as an overall film, um, you know, I've seen enough movies now to where actors just fucking completely take you out of it. Like, I just watched Anthony Michael Hall in Halloween Kills, and it was the most jarring thing I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, you don't think his like, what is- sensitive portrayal of Tommy Doyle was... Uh, evil dies tonight how many times did he say that line uh, like that was insanity so so when you <laughs> when i see performances like that i just i really appreciate the cohesive nature of of a full cast right so so my particular you know thing with horror movies is i i tend to like movies that are that feel smaller so without mobs I guess I should say, yeah. but uh, movies like this, because yeah, you, you're not just in one location. It's not that, and you have multiple storylines and characters, but they all converge in the same place. It, it feels smaller and it feels contained. And therefore I just feel like it helps the story in so many ways. So I would say like everybody in this movie, I think did a great job, you know, even red. I mean, everybody, it wasn't outstanding, but everybody played their part perfectly and knew their role, so to speak. And, and like you said though, too, it's like, then you got people like Anthony Perkins doing what Anthony Perkins do. (laughs) And it's like, that's all you really need. Get a couple good performances, have a great supporting cast. Don't let anybody drop the ball. And from my, from what I watched, it didn't seem like anybody at any point did that. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, so onto the recurring themes of the movie, um, we, we touched on this, but 
the ideas of redemption and resurrection are certainly there, uh, both in the bird that emerges uh, like a phoenix from the bag of dead birds. And, yes. and also, Maureen Coyle, for all intents and purposes, kind of dies and is resurrected in this movie. You know, yep. she, she cuts her wrists and has her vision of death and wakes up and is sort of a new person to, to some degree. And and also with Norman, you know, like the, the whole idea of the third act of this movie, especially with Maureen Coyle, is that he is going to be able to uh, free himself from the past and be reborn into this other life where he can run away with Maureen, leave the Bates Motel behind and all that stuff. Yep. Right. But instead we get mother breaking free and like he alludes to the end. Now, see, this is where I was going to ask you, though, Bo, about that. You know, it's about kind of resurrecting and like starting over and with how everything happened. And and he says, but now I'm free. That could be taken in, in a couple different ways. And I'm curious to how you saw that. Well, I think. My own take on this movie is that the central idea is that you can be redeemed and reformed, but not without violence or or not without a violent action. Like, you know, Maureen is restored, but only after she attempts suicide. And Norman is restored, but only after he like literally desecrates this body laying in a bed with a knife Mm -hmm. and you know whether or not like he's institutionalized and everything at the end of this but he still uh, i do think that at least where we end with psycho three he is free of the influence of mother because he is like the his one chance at being a normal person was taken away from him by his his mother or the mother uh persona and so destroying right. that allows him to you know to be a whole person he, and he's still right. got to suffer the repercussions of his actions and so forth but yeah i think yeah. i think the idea is that yeah that people can change that people can be free of their past but it just requires um, it, it requires a violent act uh, of one form or another, you know, whether right. it's a personally violent, like it can be emotionally violent and not physically violent, but, but something dramatic has to shift. I, I, I honestly find that's true in real life though. For me too. It's always been say if like the want is there for something, um, but that might not be strong enough. It almost feels like it has to be, it has to be many things that act as a catalyst it has to be several things it has to be kind of a not a perfect storm but a storm of things that that happen at the exact you know same time in order to kind of propel you into the next stage or whatever and that's how i felt like you know jeff fahey played into all this as well i mean obviously it's a movie and you need other characters in it but i do like how it all converged and kind of acted like the, the thing to kind of, you know, snap Norman or Mother out of it and 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 make a choice one way or another. Yeah, well, you needed the death of John Belushi for Robin Williams to stop doing cocaine, you know? Yes, exactly. Good reference. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, like, like, like you said, there has to be something dramatic that happens to you to yep. call attention to whatever behavior it is that you want to change or whatever part of your life you want to change. Like, yep. you know, it's, it, I, it's very difficult to make changes to your life. If you're perfectly comfortable, you know, right. right. <laughs> like right. Every, everything is cool, but here's this change I want to make. It's why, you know, like people drastically change their diets after a heart attack, not before you know (laughs) yeah exactly Uh, right that's it yeah um all right so some some final thoughts out of me here uh just to to give my two cents you know my siskel and ebert style recap uh i my biggest complaint with the movie is that in light of the two movies that came before it it leans very heavily into being a, a very slashery kind of movie especially with like 
these co-ed murders going on with Red and Patsy and so forth. Uh, right. But that being said, like Anthony Perkins is still amazing as Norman Bates. Um, I think the tone is, is a little all over the place because sometimes it's kind of a serious character study with with Norman, and then sometimes it just becomes like this trashy kind of slasher movie with Jeff Fahey and uh, Red being thrown out into the the cold with no top <laughs> and that kind of thing. But even with that, like the dark comedy elements, like with the the ice machine, that's really fun, even though there are moments where I'm like, I don't know that that totally belongs in this movie, but all right. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, right. And, and I've said it a couple of times now, but the color palette in this movie, I think is just gorgeous. I think some of the cinematography is great. So um, it's kind of an uneven mix for me, but I still like it. Right. So what right. about what about you? Where, where did you kind of we'll get to ratings here in a second, but yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Um, you know, it's when I first uh, watched these for the skeleton crew for the first time, um, this one really took me by surprise for, for obvious reasons. It's such a different movie than the other two. And it is more in slasher ter- territory, which I say is kind of like my jam, so to speak. But will that work for a psycho movie for me? Um, it really did. And not, not in the way that I'm normally used to. Right. And I find it really refreshing. I like characters that, you know, it's not like a big fucking twist that Jeff Fahey was a douchebag at the end and and, and how that all played out the way it did. But I found it refreshing. I found it something different. I found it different enough because in so many movies, you just see the same thing with slight changes and it's just like, ah, it's literally like the same thing. And, And then you got remakes and all these other adaptations of movies and it's all just the same shit so with this i don't know i love i love psycho um i love psycho too like i i i i I like psycho too i would say that i love this movie because again it keeps it cohesive in a world where you know you got your freddies and your michaels and your jason it's just norman like it's Norman and and in his head, and you got the motel as the backdrop. You know the swamp is makes an appearance in every fucking movie, like you said, um, unsuccessfully to to Norman, obviously. But um, it's just it feels very contained, like a place that that I've known my entire life. It just feels right, you know. And obviously, it's a these are horror movies, right? And obviously, like some of them are are scary at some parts creepy sad depressing like i find this more sad than anything with norman you know but i also feel like norman would be fine like in a mental institution like he'd fit in well like, oh yes oh dinner dinner's at four okay like he'd just dig it like whatever yeah he's, so, he's the uh, nicest guy <laughs> in cell right. block seven or whatever like yeah <laughs> exactly he probably volunteers to like do the extra mopping to get an extra muffin or whatever. Oh, you know? so it works so, in the library and it, yes. yeah, a, a, yes. mo- a model inmate for sure. Exactly. And I don't know. There's just something about the character, about the world, um, about kind of so many, so many times you see franchises kind of go off the rails. And while this did something different, I never felt like it wasn't so different where it was like jarring. Like, oh, we're, this isn't even the, the same thing. It feels all cohesive, yet different at the same time. And isn't that what you really want in a movie? Keep all the good stuff that you love and keep that cohesiveness, but change it up enough to, you know, kind of deliver something new, maybe for for to see something new and for maybe new audiences to bring them in i don't know what the purpose was but i don't really care because i loved it all like i dug this movie and it you know it's funny people ask people are so curious to ask me about this one in particular like i I've, I've been asked by like five or six people like what i think of psycho three and i think that's because it's a flip of the coin of whether i fucking like it or not you know, uh, it just so happens that with this movie, though, yeah, man, I loved it. Like, I had a lot of fun with this movie. Excellent. Well, that will bring us to uh, ratings. Of course, we do a uh, 
one to five stars kind of rating uh, system yep. here. We do allow half stars, uh, but not quarter stars because we're not monsters. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where do you land with uh, Psycho 3? Okay, so I, I gave this a lot of thought. I probably land... Oh man, I'm still unsure up until this moment. It, it, it was a, it was kind of a tough one to rate because you get into more or less of things things that do matter and that don't matter. But how much do they really matter? Like how much did it infringe on my enjoyment? Um, I don't think that things had a huge uh, change in terms of. Uh, sorry, that's my dog here. In, in terms of how much I love this movie. So I would rate this uh, a solid four out of five. I really dug it. Excellent. I'm a little lower than you. Uh, I think just because I'm not as big a slasher fan. Right. Um, so right. I'm going to land at a three, but I also don't disagree with anything you said. Um, yeah. I think I prefer the second one just because it's a little bit more of uh, uh more of a character study of, of norman bates in the later yeah. years uh but this is a lot of fun and it's a great like this is more of a party movie than psycho or psycho 2 this feels like you could watch it with a group of people and have a blast with it as opposed yeah. to the first two movies that are like no 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 you need to be alone and sit down and pay attention <laughs> right Th this yeah, one's a little more like, hey, you can throw this on in the background, and and when you look up at the screen, something something fun is going to be happening. Right, right. And now I gotta ask. Um, now you're doing part four as well, right? That's right. With Elliot uh, from it, isn't Elliot? That, in yes, it? that's right. Henry Thomas plays a young Norman Bates. Yeah. I I haven't seen that movie in forever. I tried to watch it one time and I, I thought it was complete shit. I'm gonna watch it because not only am I do I want to continue the story after watching you know the movie for this podcast, but I want to listen to your thoughts on it as well. Like I can't wait. That is a very divisive movie uh, for a lot of people. Uh, not a lot. There's there are a few people that like it. Most most people hate it. <laughs> yeah, it's. <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I don't want to tip my hat too much. Uh, I don't tip my hand. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, but I'm excited for that show, though. It, I am. It's it's going to be a very fun conversation because Psycho Four is such an oddball movie, in that it's it's a made for cable movie, but Anthony Perkins is back as Norman Bates, and it definitely continues the story. But you know, it's also directed by Mick Garris. And right. very much directed by Mick Garris. And yes. yeah, it's and and you know, the it it answers the question that whether you wanted the answer or not of what yeah. was the childhood of Norman Bates like and right. whether or not you wanted to hear it, here it comes. And uh <laughs> so we'll yeah. we'll get deeper into it. Um to, to wrap up the show, though, uh, first of all, we have the three things that you may not know about Psycho 3. Ooh. Uh, first of all, you may not be aware, but uh, Anthony Perkins wanted to film all of this in black and white and yep. was not allowed by the studio <laughs> because they were like, nobody wants to watch black and white movies. and uh, But he wanted to do that as, as sort of an homage to Hitchcock. Right. Right. Um, you may not know that the scene in which Diana Scarwood is performing nude when she is getting into the, the bath before she cuts her wrists, yes. uh, she did not mm -hmm. do that scene. That was instead oh. done by Brink Stevens, famous scream queen, uh, oh, who was in, really? you know, Nightmare Sisters and, you know. Uh, what what is the the slime ball bolorama movie? But yeah, uh, that that Brink Stevens is the bare ass that you see in uh, Psycho Three. And I'm gonna have to go back and get a better look. Bo. Yeah, it's uh, that that's her. All right, put a put a poster on your wall. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> lastly, uh, the third thing you may not know about Psycho Three. Um, Anthony Perkins was so bowled over by the movie Blood Simple, which had come out uh, about a year Ooh. before they shot it, Ooh. he had his entire cast and crew watch the movie, and a lot of the camera work 
was inspired not just by Hitchcock, but by Blood Simple, which in fairness oh. is a very Hitchcockian film. Yes, very much so. And it's so crazy to think like that's when the Coen brothers and all that kind of started back then to see it cross with Anthony Perkins. That just blows my mind. Yeah, that yeah, he was so so in love with the Blood Simple that he was like, I kind of want to do uh, a movie like Blood Simple. And oh, I love it. Yeah. So those are the three things you may not know about Psycho 3. Uh, you are leaving this podcast a little smarter than when you got here. Um, first of all, Dan, thanks so much <laughs> for doing this. Dude, uh, thank th- you, man. Thank th- you. This has been an absolute blast. Um, yeah, man. I didn't think we were going to talk a- as much about nudity on the walls, and I really like that we did. I love it. I love that we did. No, hey, man, we've been uh, podcasting uh, a couple times um, recently, and they have been not only hilarious, but just, like, so much fun to talk to you. Obviously, like, you bring a lot to the table, um, a lot of, obviously, knowledge and and great perspective. But, man, uh, what did you call it again, the Nuthouse? The Giggle Factory? Yeah, feel free. The Giggle Factory! Like, you're fucking one-liners, man. I, I'll never get sick of them. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. Uh, yeah, and, and th- again, thanks for thanks for having me on your show. Uh, yeah. And and uh, one last time, be sure you tell everybody where they can find you um, so that after they listen to this, they will certainly want to, and, and where can they do such a thing? Yeah, man, all the, uh, all the podcasting downloadable apps, we are on all of them. Uh, just search Cut to the Chase, man. We do, uh, we do tons of stuff. We just reviewed the latest Halloween Kills, a.k.a. Uh, Tommy overreacts to everything. And uh, it, it's Tommy interrupts fun. karaoke. <laughs> oh, my dude, that is no, Bo. Can we just like do a commentary on that whole bar scene as to how not to introduce three legacy characters? It was a punchline to a joke, Bo. It was like to- Tommy Wallace and uh, and Lindsay and and Marion Crane walk into a bar. No, wait, that's the start of the movie. Yeah, yeah, it- uh, yeah. So <laughs> we get into all of that and more uh, horror movies. We do non horror movies. I honestly don't give a shit. I just love talking about movies with my friends so under the cut to the chase feed you can find all our stuff please check it out and thanks again bo you're the man ah my pleasure man thanks so much and you can also